We are talking about the Sandman phenomenon. Now, Obama, who was an unknown, came across as a Sandman who would answer everyone's wishes. Remember that? In fact, I, when I first heard him, when he was saying he's going to shrink government, he's going to make it honest, he was saying we're going to make it as uh, transparent as you can imagine, we're going to kick the bums out. He was a liar. The man has turned out to be an authoritarian demagogue of the lowest order. And now he's still lying through his teeth. I want you to listen to clip 19 of the last Sandman we got. Barack Hussein Obama in clip 19. We have been very stringent and very tight, and our numbers all check out when it comes to the costs and the benefits uh, that we apply to these tests. Even on some of the big regulations you hear about that you don't like, they're not, pa they're not issued unless we th the benefits substantially uh, outweigh the costs. Uh, uh, um, and we, can, we uh, have the numbers to prove it. So uh, for those of you who think that uh, I'm just a big government crazy liberal, you know, we're, we're actually, we, we've crunched some numbers around here. Uh, we take it very seriously. Can you crunch the numbers on Michelle's 72 personal assistants, Mr. Obama? How do those numbers work out? You said that unless the benefits substantially outweigh the cost. Do the benefits to your wife outweigh the cost to the taxpayer? And by the way, can you please crunch the numbers on all the golfing vacations that you've taken, you and your family? Do the benefits outweigh the cost, Mr. Obama? Let's just start with you and your family. How about the cost of your mother-in-law living in the White House? Who pays for that? Do the benefits outweigh the costs, Mr. Obama? So you're still lying right to this day. So you say, who's the next Sandman? That's the question. Obama lied. They all do. That's why they're called politicians. The word politician inherently means someone who's going to deceive the public. De deceive the public. That's what it means. You run for office. You have to appeal to the widest possible audience that you can and then deliver as little as you promised without getting thrown into get into jail. That, that's the nature of a politician, which is why I'm not in politics. You think with my charisma I couldn't have run for office? You must be joking. What, are you joking? I couldn't have run for office? I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. It is rock and roll of talk radio, the Savage Nation. <laughs> it really is in its own way. I looked back, watching that show Vinyl on HBO, it, was, it wasn't bad last night. It got better. Billions got worse. You know, one gets better, one gets worse. These Sunday night shows, at least I got Vinyl to watch before Billions. So I got two hours to kill on Sunday night without a total and absolute Welsh Schmerz meltdown on a Sunday night, which is always the worst night of the week. The worst night of the week. Even as a kid, those Sunday nights were a disaster for me. Ed Sullivan, suicide. When I saw Ed Sullivan, the Ed Sullivan show coming on on Sunday nights, I got such a depression, I didn't even know what it was. A sadness, a horrible feeling. Because I had to go to school the next day with a teacher who had a toilet water on her that gave me a migraine. I didn't know to this day what it was, what I hated about elementary school. It was her toilet water. And that she, I, I don't mean to be a little, you know, it's a family show. But she'd expose herself to the children. I, I maybe by accident. I don't know. But the whole combination package got me sick. To this day, I am. I remember that teacher. I get migraines from it. Thinking about it. So we're talking about this election. And okay, so Saturday night was the big thing, the big victory. I didn't. I didn't even know what happened. I didn't watch it. The, the returns. I went somewhere. I don't know where. It's nowhere important. It's not important. Last night I went to a Latin dance. I loved it because you can escape for an hour or two to the great music of... Uh, I grew up in that music in New York. It's unbelievable. This guy is a local group, Mazacote. It's unbelievable. You watch the musicians play. I know I'm getting uh, drifting off from what you want to hear about, but it's a whole thing. Your life is a whole thing. It's not two-dimensional, folks. It's many-dimensional, or else you're just a Democrat or, or a Republican, which I am not. I never have been. So I'm saying, okay, so who's your Sandman? For some it's Cruz, for some it's this one, for some it's Trump. Uh, Obama, we saw what kind of Sandman. This guy was this liar. He's still getting away with it. So the next one's going to disappoint you. I mean, Hitler was Germany's Sandman. They were in a depression. They lost the war. They were humiliated. He came up with a scapegoat. The Jews did it to them. And look where he went. 
Now we learn today Hitler had a deformed penis as well as just one testicle, historians claim. If I were making this up, you'd think I'm a clown. It, it was a story today on the Drudge Report. I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, what? I heard about the, you know, the one thing. I didn't know about the other part. Hitler had a tiny deformed you-know-what as well as just one you-know-what, historians claim. Hitler suffered from a condition called hypospadias. Hypospadias? Sounds like a Greek dish. Hypospadias? It sounds like spanakopita. Hypo, okay, hypo, yeah, spadias, which left him with an abnormally small manhood, according to historians Jonathan Mayo and Emma Craigie. And that's what made him rage and conquer other countries. Oh, God, that's horrible. I thought it was the hypoglycemia where he would eat these these rich pastries because he was a vegetarian and a teetotaler. He didn't drink alcohol. And he was a veggie. He didn't like to kill animals, only people. He liked to torture people to death and watch movies about that. But he would get sick if he watched an animal being hunted. But I thought it was the hypoglycemic attacks that accounted for his madness. Low, low blood sugar. But the notorious playground rhyme about his uh, single you-know-what uh, seems to have only told half the story as a, a new book claims the leader of the Third Reich had a micro penis. Now, why am I telling you this? One, because you're interested in it. I saw it this morning, and it's from a newspaper in England called a telegram. Maybe the guy's just selling a book. How would you know a thing like that? Oh, they've discovered medical records which confirm the Fuhrer's embarrassing deformity. I don't want to read all the details. Uh, I'll leave that to you. This discovery that Hitler had only one and a small one may explain why Hitler was allegedly afraid of being seen naked and the cause of his famed fits of rage. It also is likely to add to fuel to the debate on Hitler's sex life, or lack thereof, which is fiercely contested by historians. In his biography of Hitler, the British historian Ian Kershaw said the Austrian-born Nazi was repelled by sexual activity of any kind as he feared catching an infection. He only liked to invade and murder. That's all. Sex he didn't like. That goes back to the war, like the Vietnam War, where they put flowers in the gun and said, make love, not war. They weren't wrong in a way. They should put, try to do that with the Taliban. Put a, put a flower in their ba a rifle barrel, girls. All you aging hippies over in county, go over there to Iraq and uh, Syria. See if you can put a flower in the Taliban's gun barrel. See if you'll get away with it. But I'm getting distracted here by this story because it, it, it connects to my main theme. My main theme is that you're looking for a Sandman. Everyone wants a Sandman to save the country, right? That's what we're all here. Now, we know Hitler is... I'm sorry. Almost, I'm sorry, Hitler. I'm, we know Hillary is not the Sand Woman. We know that. We know what to get from her. She's a complete liar. Useless liar from a thug machine. Worthless. So we know she offers nothing. No hope, no change, nothing. Not even the hope of a change. Zero. At least Bernie Sanders, to his socialist credit, offered something albeit a flawed concept of socialism, but he offered something to people who are desperate for the system to be broken over their knee. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. There are a lot of people out there who are, for one reason or another, dissatisfied, whether they're poor or they're on bad health or they're a, a misguided, hateful immigrant who shouldn't have come here to begin with. Uh, they, they think Sanders is going to help them. He wouldn't help anybody, pit everyone against everyone. That's what they do, socialists. But anyway, he offered something. He was the Sandman and still is the Sandman, Bernie. Actually, Sanders, Bernie Sandman. We're going to call him Bernie Sandman from now on. But on our side, we got a couple of Sandmen. We got, actually, some look like bagmen to me. We got Ted Cruz. We got Marco Rubio, who looks like a bagman for Las Vegas. And Donald Trump was beholden to no one. Now, you see, I talk to people who are worth a lot of money, and they say at least he's not part of the system, and he's not beholden to anyone. I think that's almost the crux of the whole matter. Now, his, his beautiful family doesn't hurt him, by the way, but they weren't seen in the beginning. So you can't say that's the big reason for a success. His unadulterated ability to stand up to bullies by being a bigger bully makes him appealing to us because we live in such a vicious world that we need someone to bully the vermin on the planet into submission in plain English. It's like getting a verbal, mar a verbal cage fighter running for the presidency. Write it down before it's stolen, before it leaves my mouth. Trump is like a verbal cage fighter, and we don't care how crude he is. We don't care how rude he is. We just want him to take the enemy and make him bleed on the canvas. 
We'd like to see them. We'd like to see our enemies smashed to death and bleeding on the canvas, having to be dragged out by an ambulance by us on a stretcher. And we know he's the one who's liable to do it. No one else. It's plain English. We all want a strong leader after this eight years of this wimpy lie who stabbed us in the back. You know, talk loudly and carry a limp stick. Barack Obama. Tough with everyone in America and a wimp on the world stage. Because he knows he can control us with the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA. We're all afraid of him. Because he uses these corrupt governmental agencies to intimidate us in plain English. Okay, so... As I stand before you, again, I come back to my primary Monday theme today. Who is your Sandman and why? And we go back again to Donald Trump. He's the Sandman for a lot of people, for the reasons I explain. Now, many of you distrust him. I get that. You distrust him for your reasons, and I understand that. Whether I do or I don't is irrelevant to you. You're skeptical, and you're naturally skeptical of anyone in politics, which you should be. And that's absolutely true. However... Remember how he came to power and on what theme? Build a wall with Mexico, do you remember? And right after Kate Steinle's vicious murder at the hands of a Mexican illegal alien in San Francisco, it sure struck home. It was right after he announced that issue of build the wall, make the Mexicans pay for it. It was like someone saying it after Obama destroyed our borders and told the Border Patrol to stand down. Someone's going to stand up for America's borders? Hey, that's a big one. Because how many years have I been preaching the, the, uh, the mantra of borders, language, culture? Forever. Borders, language, culture. See, with borders, you get language and you get your culture back, by the way. Without borders, you have no language and you have no culture. It, it, it seeps out of your nation, just as your, your protoplasm will leak out of your cell if you destroy the cell membrane. Or in the case of a plant, the cell wall. The protoplasm leaks out of the cell if you cut the, the, the membrane or the cell wall. Same with the border. You cut the border, the culture seeps out. And in this case, diseases and terrible foreign influences seep in. Because not all immigrants are the same. That's number one. Not all cultures come here to add anything. We all know that. Number two. And there's a lot of hurting people in America, number three, who don't want the competition. Now, having said that, please don't put me in the category of Mr. Xenophobe because I'm the last person on earth. And I'm going to prove it to you. I challenge any other talk show host in this con in this nation, left or right, any one of these lily white talk show hosts, liberal or conservative, to tell me that they actually go down in the streets with the average person. They don't. I dare any lily white talk show host, NPR or anywhere else, to tell me that they go to a dance as I did last night with 98% black and Latino men, which I did. Why? I didn't do it to prove anything. I went for the music. Because I found something out a long time ago, even when I was a young man. Music is a universal medicine. And it, I'm talking about music. I'm not talking about violence expressed in lyrics and, and, and uh, with instruments. I'm talking about beautiful music, which tends to glorify romance and it glorifies woman. All that music is about romance and women. That's all it's about. Do you know that? It's always my heart. Me corazón, uh, son, 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 my heart, my heart, my heart. All of the music is beautiful, but it lifts you up and carries you away. And then to watch people dance, and you see the movement of the feet and the swaying of the bodies and the, the way the skeletons move underneath the flesh, and you realize it's spirit animating body. That's a beautiful thing, and I enjoyed it last night. And it's a funny thing, you know, if you're in a crowded dance hall, if I rub against a black guy or a Hispanic guy, it's always like, well, excuse me, both sides. I'm not a threatening-looking person, but I'm a human being. It's always, oh, excuse me. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It was polite. So what I'm saying to you are several things at once. Xenopho xenophobia comes from not understanding people because you're never around them. You don't even know who they are. You have no idea. Oh, I don't like this one. I don't like that one. It runs in all races, by the way, in all different directions. You actually have to be around other human beings to understand that they're all human beings, good, bad, and, ind and ugly, you know, and indifferent. So having said that, we'll come back to who's the Sandman. Who's your Sandman? And since we're coming up against the hard break, I, I wrote something beautiful for you after the... I don't know whether I wrote it before it. I got a little chuckle to myself. I was coming out of the dance club last night, and it was already dusk over in Sausalito, California. And, you know, I got to... So many things I want to say at once all of a sudden. 
there's an area in uh, in the Bay Area that I go to. Now, I started my radio career. 